There are six key competitive issues that face business and HR today. These six issues are detailed in length in your textbook, and I'm going to walk through each one and provide some additional examples and explanations. The first one is responding strategically to changes in the local and global market. What do we mean by that? Well, today we say that we operate in an anything, anytime, anywhere market in partnership with foreign firms across the world. It's estimated that 70 to 85% of the Canadian economy is affected by international competition. How does this impact HR, you might ask? Well, when we're doing business globally, we're dealing with a complicated set of issues related to different geographies and time zones, working with different cultures, different employment laws, and certainly different business practices and cultures. And these fall to HR to figure out, again, in partnership with line and area managers. For instance, let's say you want to expand your business to Alberta. So it doesn't even need to be a global expansion, maybe just a national expansion. The first thing you might ask yourself is, how are we going to hire people in Alberta? What's the minimum wage in Alberta? Are there any different business practices that we need to be aware of? For instance, are statutory holidays different there? The answer to all those questions is yes. There are a lot of differences, even between provinces such as Ontario and Alberta. As a partner, you would line up with your HR manager to help figure out what these challenges and issues are to make sure that you're complying with all legal and regulatory concerns in a different province. Now, if you expand that to, let's say you want to actually expand to a different country, like Thailand. Again, what are the different cultural practices, employment laws, and possible business practices that you need to be aware of? You would partner with your HR person in your own business to help you figure these out. So human resources issues underlie each of these concerns as you try to expand your business. This ties in very, very strongly to change management. So change management is all about a systematic way to bringing about organizational change at both the organization level and the individual level. Most people understand that change is continuous. We hear about it all the time, that jobs change, responsibilities change, and work processes change, but yet people often resist it. Successful change rarely occurs naturally or easily for anyone. There are two different types of change that we often see and discuss when we're talking about responding strategically to change. There's reactive change. This is change that occurs after external forces have already affected performance, typically negatively. So when performance has been affected negatively, a company reacts and changes somehow to respond to that. There's also though proactive change where companies take an initiative to take advantage of potential opportunities in the marketplace proactively, looking to change their business to take advantage. Can you think of a company that's responded strategically to changes in the marketplace, or perhaps one that didn't? One example that we always think of when we're talking about proactive change are things like that we see every day out there in the world. Think of Tim Hortons and how they provide self-serve coffee at some locations or even Starbucks with their mobile app that you can use so that you can order your coffee online and then just drive by and pick it up. That's proactively seeing some change. Maybe some potential opportunities in the marketplace where you can expand your business. Or even companies like Shopify. It's a Canadian company that provides an online platform for entrepreneurs to launch an online business. Then there's reactive change or companies that don't respond to change very well. Things like Blockbuster, we don't hear of them anymore. We've got things like Rogers On Demand now and Netflix. So Blockbuster tried to change after external forces had already affected their performance, like the launch of Rogers On Demand and Netflix, but it was too little too late in that case. Some other ways that companies can respond to changes happening. Some things like downsizing. This is a planned elimination of jobs. We sometimes call it a de decrease in headcount. 
This is where companies respond to change by maybe instituting a layoff, which can be permanent or temporary, reducing the number of people that they have. Although human capital may be their biggest asset, they are also their more ex most expensive asset. So downsizing may be one way to respond proactively to a change or possibly reactively to a change in the marketplace. Another way they can respond is by something called outsourcing. This is where companies contract outside the organization to have work done that was formerly done by people inside the business. Can you think of some examples of companies who may outsource some activities? Again, some that we tend to think of are things like payroll or even providing security to a company. These are things that can be outsourced. So perhaps payroll is done by a large company like ADP Software. Or security might be something that's done by an outside firm like Securitas or someone else. So perhaps you used to have people in your company doing these functions, but then you outsource this activity. This is both a cost saving and a time saving for business, which is why it's done proactively and sometimes reactively. Reactively to save some money or proactively because you see an opportunity for a time saving. You don't need to worry about scheduling or handling these activities anymore as part of your internal business. Another way that companies can respond is something called offshoring or global sourcing. This is the practice of sending jobs to other countries. I just want to make sure that you're clear on these two different definitions. Outsourcing is where someone else does the work for us. That's what we just talked about with payroll, for instance, or security. Offshoring is where the work is done overseas to take advantage of cheaper labor rates, but they're still our employees doing the jobs. A few more ways companies can respond strategically to change. Something called Six Sigma. You may hear about this more if you're in the operations and supply chain program. This is a set of principles and practices where the core idea includes understanding customer needs, doing things right the first time, and constantly striving for continuous improvement. In hand with this is something called re-engineering. And this is a fundamental rethinking and radical redesign of business processes to achieve dramatic improvement in cost, quality, service, and speed. There's some very famous examples of business process re-engineering re around the world. And let me just talk about one for a few minutes. Taco Bell. You may be familiar with Taco Bell, which is a fast food Mexican restaurant. They re-engineered their business and focused more on the retail service aspect and centralized the manufacturing area. You may not immediately think of Taco Bell as a manufacturer, but they are. They manufacture food. They came up with a concept called the K minus program, which is a kitchenless restaurant. And there, the meat, the corn shells, the beans, the lettuce, the cheese, the tomatoes for their restaurants are now prepared in a central co commission area outside the restaurant. Therefore, at the restaurants, the prepared ingredients come in and they're simply assembled when they're ordered by the customer. So the preparation takes place elsewhere and then just the assembly happens inside the restaurant. This increased employee morale, increased their quality control, they found that they had fewer accidents and injuries, and a huge savings of time and energy by focusing more on business processes. Taco Bell went from going from a $500 million company in 1982 to a $3 billion company by the early 1990s through this process of re-engineering. The second competitive issue I want to talk about briefly is setting and achieving corporate social responsibility and sustainability goals. When we're talking about corporate social responsibility, the short form for that today is CSR. And this is the responsibility of a firm to act in the best interest of the people and the communities that are affected by their activities. We sometimes call this good citizenship. Corporate social responsibility is not the law, but it certainly helps provide a better image of the company outside there in the world. 
Along these lines is also something called sustainability. This is closely related to corporate social responsibility, although it's slightly different, because this refers to a company's ability to produce goods or services without damaging the environment or depleting a resource. Things like recycling, for instance, or reducing carbon emissions help with sustainability. We link these two together, although they are not the same thing, but they both fall under this umbrella of being a good corporation. The impact to HR is that many times these are the responsibility of HR to help roll out programs of CSR and sustainability. And certainly the biggest impact is they affect the employer brand and the recruitment efforts. For instance, if a company has a negative brand because of perhaps CSR or sustainability, they may have a hard time recruiting people to work for that business. The opposite is also true. If they have a positive brand for CSR and sustainability, they have a better chance of finding great employees and keeping great the third competitive issue is advancing technology. This is an issue or challenge that's been happening for many decades, but it continues to shape the way we do business in the marketplace and definitely impacts human resources. When we're talking about advancing technology, we're talking a lot about collaborative software. This allows workers to work from anytime, anywhere, and share information with each other. We saw this a lot with COVID-19. Suddenly people who had not worked before worked from home, suddenly were working from home, anywhere, anytime. We took advantage of collaborative software to enable businesses to continue working even though people were at home. So this advancing technology changes how and where and companies do business. It also helps us move from something called a touch labor to knowledge worker. It reduces the number of jobs that require little skill and increases the number of jobs that require considerable skill. Because we're, when we're talking about knowledge workers, we're talking about workers whose responsibilities extend beyond the physical execution of work. And they include instead things like decision making, problem solving, communication, planning. This little diagram shows it nicely. We move from industry work, where we talked about the basis of operation was the structure of someone's activity. Really, they were all focused on procedures, control, and compliance. That's a touch worker. Today, we see we're much more focused on knowledge workers, where people are working with other people. They're empowered to make decisions and they're participating in the business. And the basis of their operation is the knowledge of the people. So we've moved a lot from industry work to knowledge work, from touch workers in industry to knowledge workers. The advancing technology has impacted human resources when it comes to something called an HRIS system, Human Resources Information System. This is a computerized system that provides current and accurate data for the purposes of control and decision making. An HRIS system automates routine tasks and it lowers administrative costs which increase productivity and response time. It is a computerized system that has all of the information about all of your employees. The routine tasks that we've gotten rid of are things like having employee files for each person or having to maintain hard copy logs of training that's taken place. Now things are automated, so we've increased our productivity and our response time to our employees and to managers. So when they have a question about an employee or about, let's say, training that they have or what someone's salary, we can easily access this information through our HRIS system. It also provides self-serve access. So if I as an employee have questions about my own benefits, for instance, or about training or how much vacation I have, I can go into the system myself and access my own personnel file. So I can see what information I need to have and I don't need to call someone or ask someone else for that information. 
The third benefit is it helps us with online recruiting, screening, and pre-testing of applicants. If you've ever applied for a job online, you've actually been interacting with an HRIS system. That job that you applied for, if there were drop-down boxes, things that you had to check off well, before you uploaded your resume, you were actually entering all your information right into their system. They were then able to pull a report, do a sort, and decide who they wanted to call for an interview. There's also tracking, training, and selecting of your own employees. In the HRIS system, I would have a complete profile of all of my people, so I would know who has what education, who has what training, and who has what background. That way, when I'm thinking about promotion, or if I'm adding a new position and I want to encourage some people inside my business to apply, I would be able to go through my HRIS system and be able to select people that already have the knowledge and skills that I'm looking for. Last but not least, an HRIS system allows organizations to what we have call have an alignment or cascading of goals. What we mean by this is, if the company sets a goal, let's say a target, that everyone needs to be trained in mental health by the end of the calendar year. In the past, it would be up to managers to take that initiative, go to each employee, talk to them about what needs to be done, and then follow up with them to make sure that that training happens and report that back to HR so that they could put that in a hard copy file. Well, you can imagine that's fine if you only have 30 or 40 employees, but let's say you have 800 employees or 8,000 employees. How do you ever cascade that type of goal forward? Well, with an HRIS system, you could communicate with your employees via email. When they do the training, let's say even online, as soon as they complete that training, that would be registered in the HRIS system. And at the end of the fiscal year, you could run a quick report, literally in minutes, that would tell you who's completed the training and who hasn't. No more falling through the cracks if this is an organization-wide goal or alignment that you're trying to achieve. So there's lots of benefits to both the employee and the managers to have an HRIS system in place. You think for a second about how social media has impacted human resource management. We're gonna talk much more about this when we talk about recruiting and hiring, but for the purposes of thinking about technology, social media has definitely impacted HR. It's a new way to attract people, but it also helps build our company brand, positively or negatively. And we certainly require social media policies now. There's lots of policies about using social media in the workplace, branding ourselves, and what we do on social media impacting our employment. So we'll have some fun later this semester exploring this concept a bit further. The fourth competitive challenge is containing costs while retaining talent and maximizing productivity. When we're talking about this, what we're talking about really are a few different concepts. Some of these we've just talked about. When we're thinking about keeping our best people and maximizing productivity, well, we're trying to keep costs down, we can do things like downsizing, outsourcing, or offshoring. But let's talk about three things we haven't touched upon yet that helps us maximize productivity and sometimes contain our costs. Carefully managing employee benefits, furloughing of employees, and employee. So HR professionals need to simultaneously focus on keeping our top talent, our best people like you in the organization. We want to maximize your productivity, but at the same time, we have to reduce costs. It's a constant challenge in business to keep productivity up and costs down. One way we do that in human resources is to carefully manage our employees' benefits. When we're talking about benefits, we're talking about things like medical and dental benefits. Not all companies offer these today, but many do. This is something that needs to be managed carefully. So for instance, 
If I'm offering eyeglasses as a benefit to my employees, that might cost my company $100 a year for each one of my employees. I need to carefully manage this benefit because first of all, those costs can rise, but I also need to make sure that my employees are taking advantage of it. Because if I'm paying for something that only two or 3% of my workforce is actually using, it's kind of wasting my money. So in a, a good HR department is constantly monitoring and managing the employee benefits to see what people are using, what they're costing, and shopping these benefits out. I often liken this to, in your own personal uh, budget, you should be managing your own, let's say, insurance policy every once in a while. So your car insurance, if you shop this around every year, you often find that you can get a better deal if you move between companies. Or even your cable, here in Ontario, moving between Rogers and Bell, for instance. You get a better deal if you leave one company and go to another. Now, I'm not suggesting that as an HR person, you're gonna constantly move or change your benefits carrier, but you do wanna keep negotiating with them to make sure that you're getting the best value for your money for your employees. The second concept I wanna talk about is something called furloughing employees. Everyone struggles with this word. I always think of it like a fur coat. This is a situation in which an organization asks or requires employees to take time off for either no pay or reduced pay. So perhaps working a shorter work week and getting reduced pay or just taking some time off with no pay. This certainly helps out companies as a short term way to save a little bit of money. So let's say something happens dramatic in the workforce. We saw a little bit of this with COVID-19. Some companies ask employees to take a furlough, take a bit of time off with no pay, because quite simply their business had ground to a halt and they didn't want to lay their people off. They wanted them to return as soon as the business was able to open again. So in that case, they did a furlough of employees. The last thing that companies can do is something called employee leasing. And this is where you may dismiss an employee or perhaps an employee retires, and then you hire them back through a leasing company on a contract. The advantage to this is you're bringing back all of the knowledge and skills and abilities that they have, their human capital, but you don't no longer have the cost of benefits and vacation pay. Perhaps it's also short term as well. It may just be for a few months to help you cover a specific project or get something accomplished. When we're trying to contain costs and maximize productivity, layoff might be one option. This is certainly one way to potentially save the company some money is to lay off some workers. But there are some hidden costs to a layoff that we need to consider before we go down this road as an HR or line manager. The first thing is severance cost. What is severance cost? Well, by definition of the Employment Standards Act, Severance cost is compensation that is paid by an employer to an employee who has had their employment severed or stopped. What this means is if someone is laid off, terminated for reasons other than firing for costs, they need to have some amount of money paid to them. It is compensation in the place of termination notice. We're gonna explore this later on this semester. But this severance cost can be very expensive because we have to look at the amount of time that the person has worked, their age, and their job to calculate severance cost. There's also potentially accrued vacation or sick day payout. What we mean by this is, if you've been working all year and you haven't taken any vacation time, you are allowed certain amounts of vacation time by law that you are accruing or banking and waiting to take your time. If you're laid off before you've used that vacation, we need to pay you for that vacation time that you haven't used. We may also have to pay you some sick day payouts as well if you've been accumulating sick day. This can again vary based on the company and what our policy is, but we need to think about this could be as many as a few weeks of pay that we need to pay at the time of layoff. 
depending on the structure of our pension plan and perhaps even benefits plan, there may be some payout required there to buy you out of the plans. We also have to think about, is there a potential lawsuit? Sometimes people will approach an employment lawyer and, and perhaps launch a lawsuit against us. This can be a hidden cost of layoff. There's definitely a loss of institutional memory and trust in management. When layoffs start to happen, people start to lose trust in the management team. And of course, if this is just a short-term solution, we could be in a bit of a problem if the economy rebounds. Last but not least, the people who are left, we call them survivors. They are definitely risk averse, paranoid, and sometimes political. What we mean by that is, if you've been working side by side with someone for let's say 10 years, and suddenly that person that you've sat next to, ate lunch with every day, talked about their vacation and their kids, and they are suddenly gone, and you're left, you may be paranoid about, am I next? You may be very hesitant to take any risk. And again, you may lose trust in your manager and management team about, are they making the best decisions for the company? There are some companies that adopt what's called a no layoff policy. This doesn't mean that you can't get fired if you don't do a good job, but it does mean that regardless of what's happening in the economy, so even with a real downturn, they would simply retrain you and move you to a different division and not lay you off. The benefits of this are enormous. You end up with a fiercely loyal and more productive workforce. Studies show that companies that adopt this also have higher customer satisfaction, typically because people will go the extra mile at the end of the day, take that one additional phone call, for instance, to help out a customer. It certainly enables them to be ready to snap back with the economy and gives them a recruiting edge. So from an HR perspective, it's great to have people who want to work for your business. You don't have to go out and recruit them. They're coming to find you. Last but not least, studies show that we have workers who are not afraid to innovate, knowing that their jobs are safe, regardless of what's happening outside of the business. The fifth competitive challenge is responding to the demographic and diversity challenges in the work. Currently in Canada, 19% of our population identifies as a visible minority, and that number is on the rise. By 2031, over 30% of Canadians will identify as visible minorities. We need the inside of our business to look like the outside of our business. And because of this, we know it's vital to increase our recruiting and training efforts and to find a more diverse workforce. Immigrants are critical to our business success here in Canada. They add strength and allow our organizations to better attract and serve a larger customer base. The second challenge is the aging workforce that we have in Canada. The number of seniors in the Canadian population continues to grow. It's actually expected to double in the next 10 years. Companies today are definitely spending some time to recruit the over 50 people, so the over 50 employees. We know that there are some disadvantages to this. Healthcare costs might be a bit higher, but we find that they are higher retention, they have lower absenteeism, and their transition costs are lower. What we mean by that is they're transitioning back to the workforce are much lower. If we look at companies like Home Depot and McDonald's, they are recruiting people over 50 because these older workers are now choosing to work longer. They have good health and longer life expectancy, which plays a big role in extending their work life. Some retirees have also returned to the workforce because of economic needs, and companies can take advantage of this by bringing them back in. Gender distribution is the next demographic and diversity challenge in the workforce. Believe it or not, the percentage of women in the, in the labor force is nearly 50%, and yet 61% of university graduates are women. Employers have to work to attract and retain women in the workforce by providing equal advancement opportunities and equal compensation, by making sure that they're accommodating working parents through providing excellent parental leave, 
by providing great work schedules that are flexible and allow for child and elder care assistance. The final issue facing HR and business today is adapting to educational and cultural shifts that affect so what do we mean by educational and cultural shifts? Well, with education, the skills gap that we talked about is widening. So moving from that touch worker to knowledge worker, there's a direct link between education and earnings, as well as education and unemployment rates. For instance, unemployment rates for those with only a high school diploma is 12 to 20 percent higher than those who have post-secondary education. That skills gap, reading literacy, is widening. Companies are spending millions of dollars on basic skill training for employees. So for instance, the diamond mine in the Northwest Territory that's looking for more of those touch workers is having to spend a lot of money on reading literacy to ensure that they have the right people and the right training in place. Culture affects behavior on our jobs as well. We view work differently based on our cultural background, and this is something that HR needs to be aware of. We as employees are more understanding of our employee rights today, of how unions play a role, of health and safety, of equal opportunity, of equal pay, and this is a shift that's happened since the advent of the internet. We have different privacy concerns as well. We have federal legislation that helps protect our information, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, which is called PIPEDA, which requires our consent for release of information, but there's no provincial legislation for private companies. So we do have concerns about privacy and where our information is. We also have changing attitudes towards work. For instance, not everyone's working for financial gain anymore. Money does not always equal happiness, at least not for everyone. Last but not least, there's balancing work and family. There's family friendly companies that have flexible work hours, that provide daycare, that provide some assistance with elder care or part-time work to, to permit this. These are things that are powerful and can attract and retain great employees. However, we have to balance our family friendly with single people as well. Otherwise, there can be resentment for benefits that are provided for those with families only. So there's a whole host of these cultural and educational shifts that are impacting the workforce today. Many of these we're going to explore throughout the semester as we talk about different things that HR works on on a daily basis.